I'd like to call the Finance Audit and Budget Committee for Tuesday, December 14th, 2021 to order. First item is Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, next item is adoption of agenda. I need a motion Romano to adopt. adopts the agenda. Zinner support. Moved by Romano, supported by Zinner. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Van Sickle, yes. Susie, yes. Okay. Uh, next item is approval of minutes dated November 16th, 2021. Uh, there's some corrections that need to be made on the minutes, so I am going to revert the minutes to our next finance committee um, if there's no objection to that or if there is any additional um, changes to the minutes. Okay, we'll postpone that to the next finance bu budget committee meeting. Uh, next item is public participation. Um, this is the first opportunity for public participation for those who would wish to speak for a maximum of three minutes on an item which is on today's agenda. There will also be a second opportunity for public particip participation for those who would like to speak on any issue. Would anyone from the public like to speak? Going once, going twice, we'll close public participation. Next item is Department Recommendations, which is 6A. We have waived by uh, the HHS Committee Chair. This is a budget amendment from Macomb Community Action, uh, Community Services Div Division for COVID Emergency Rental Assistance Program for 800000 I need a motion to recommend this to the full board. So I'll make some motion. Made by Song, supported by Wallace. Ernest, you have the floor. <coughs> Um, this is a, just a line item transfer. You'd previously approved the COVID funds. Uh, we have fully expended the SARA 1 funds. We have requested additional SARA 1 funds. We have yet to dip into the SARA 2 funds. What we found is that we need a little more money in direct assistance unless we wanted to pull from our SARA 2. So this is simply just reconciling the total amount of direct support we've given to landlords and tenants. Uh, we had budgeted more to go to staffing and administration of the funds, uh, and we've used more indirect support, which is good news. Uh, the reason we're requesting this rather than just going into SARA 2 is because those communities that have spent down SARA 1 then have more competitive chance to get additional federal funds to come into the county. Um, so we've been quick and expedient at spending our SARA 1 funds. In fact, with our pending cases now already in process, we would estimate that we're over halfway through spending our SARA 2 funds. Um, so the SARA program continues to run smoothly, uh, if not delayed, and we're seeing excellent work. This is just a line item transfer within the budget you've already approved. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, Chair Brown. Thank you. This is a big program affecting many people in Southeast Michigan, well, the whole state. Yeah. Um, your office spends a lot of time administering these programs and, and, and untangling out of the the complications that are involved with it. Um, is that burden becoming less or is it becoming, where is it in terms of the the workload? Is, 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 has it reached its peak and we're seeing a downward trend or is it well, maintaining uh, static levels? I think we're, we've gotten more efficient at the work. Um, we've used a partnership with both uh, United Way of Southeastern Michigan and a local organization called the Information Center. So the way we had structured it, we knew we wanted to use the 2 one call center so residents could call in and check their application, so that won't fall all on our staff. So a lot of the frontline work is being handled by contractors, which also can ensure that we don't bring people on temporarily just to lay them off when the grant funds are done, uh, which we consider a good approach. So because of that partnership for capacity, um, you know, I can't say that it's going smoothly or downward. That's all going to depend on the economy. We are seeing the first people coming back to seek the second round of assistance uh, after they receive the first round. So it will really vary, but right now, as I said, we, we already have thousands of applications waiting to be paid out, and we've already paid out thousands. So it is running smoother as we've got more familiar with it, but I'm not sure the workload is necessarily lighter. 
is it are they getting timely payments to them or are they running behind how's that because they're taking cause landlords have deadlines and yes and all the rest uh we do have a good partnership with lakeshore legal aid and we also work with all the courts to inform the judges how they can best advise the landlords and the tenants on the process um, we are getting fairly timely payments out but everybody understands that it's delayed the most important thing is for the landlord to understand when it's approved even if it's still in process uh, so they don't proceed to spin their legal wheels well i want to give kudos to you and of course to people under you that help support what you do but i had a couple of cases that were initially that people had questions and problems and they were upset with it greatly and uh, i turned it over to you and your team and uh you got a resolve for them how it was resolved i'm not certain but they were happy anyway that they sure. got attention to their issue so thank you for your people your team of people working on you to administer a complicated program glad to hear it thank you thank you mr chairman uh commissioner matuzak thanks mr chair hi ernest hi. so we're moving six hundred thousand out of a personnel line item uh, what, what effect does that have on programming <sighs> It's not being taken away. It's just being, it's just a line item transfer temporarily to make sure we can reconcile the direct support payments we're making to tenants and landlords. So we still have the same administrative overhead to cover staffing as we budgeted for, and we still have all of Sarah 2 to use to keep our operations going into next year. Um, this is just because with our Sarah 1 payments, we had higher payments than the staff support we anticipated. Part of that's because we use contractors instead of our own staff for it. Um, so it's, it's not a real reduction in the expenditures in that line item. It's just a transfer to true up the actual disbursements. So as we finish SARA 1, we hope to get additional SARA 1 reallocated funds. And then as we go into SARA 2, we hope to come back and tell you the same thing. We managed to get more money out the door with less overhead. And we want to transfer money to direct support instead of to personnel. Um, but we keep that personnel budget there in case and if we need it. So it, this is not an actual reduction in the staff hours we're going to pay to administer this air program. So we keep $600,000 in a personnel line item that we don't intend to use? I, I'm sorry if I'm explaining it wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not necessarily. Um, we continue to expend the funds as we budgeted but we have a backlog of direct support which we process sooner. So our direct support to tenants and landlords, those checks are written. We're trying to get them out as fast as possible. Our staffing and our contractor billings are regular. So in any given month, if we have easier applications, more timely correspondence from landlords, documents that don't need to be triple checked, we might process more checks in one month with no more staff time, but equaling more direct assistance. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, seeing no other speakers, uh, please vote. Motion passes 12 to 0. Okay, next item is also waived by the HHS uh, Committee Chair. This is a budget amendment for Macomb Community Action Grant Fund 344. Michigan Strategic Fund Regional Talent Innovation Grant for $515,000. I need a motion to recommend this to the full board. So moved to support so. Zinner. Made by Song, supported by Zinner. Ernest, you have the floor. So if you remember, uh, months ago, you had approved part of our use for the CDBG funds uh, to help residents get retrained, get new jobs, help make sure we were recovering from this pandemic. We structured that program in partnership with Michigan Works, Macomb Community College, and our Planning and Economic Development Department. In addition to the $1 million we had put into this, we were successful in seeking $500,000 to match that and to be utilized to expand this job training program for Macomb residents. So this program isn't just the 500 that we've attracted from the state, it's also the million that we're putting in. This will again help us not just provide safety net services, but long-term job training to help residents get back on their feet and recover. Um, and you can see in the back of materials the range of certificates we're going to offer. Um, these are certificates that can help put people uh, on a good track and get a good income and get back on their feet. So we're really excited about the collaboration with Michigan Works, Macomb Community College, and we're excited that it's not just our ships in the game, that we got some matching funds from the state of Michigan to help us expand this. Commissioner Song. 
Thank you, Chair. Hi, Ernest. Hi. Well, congratulations for getting the matching fund. I Thank think that's you. very impressive. My question is, how many residents mm. uh, will this actually, will you be able to actually train with sure. this amount and then also the million dollars? Yeah, assuming it's about 1.5, the average cost that we budget is, is about 6,000 per resident. So that'd be about 250 residents uh, that we would serve through this program. And is that like a one-year program, or what's the, the timeline? Uh, for each of those certificates that you see listed, it varies. The goal is that it's not over a year. Uh, plenty of these programs, like the uh, commercial driver's license program, the CDL program, might be even be six months or shorter. Um, so again, these are not degree programs. These are certification programs. Okay. Uh, the goal isn't to have somebody go to Macomb Community College for years. It's to get them in, get them out with a real-world certificate that mm -hmm. can be put and employed quickly. And do you help with the job placement too? So like upon, you know, getting, yes. obtaining the certificate, they're guaranteed or placed in a job? I, I don't know if guaranteed would be the word, but uh, Michigan works, uh, works diligently with employers uh, and talent recruitment and retention. So uh, the Michigan works process helps not just people get trained, but helps them get placed and keep in that placement. Okay, 250 seems kind of low, a number. Is that just the target or the minimum, or well, can you stretch six, those dollars six thousand dollars is about the average cost we budgeted. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent it's under six thousand, we'll serve more residents. But uh, one point five million dollars divided by six thousand is about two hundred fifty. Okay. Um, last question. Yeah. Um, so, the state has the Michigan Reconnect program, right, yes. where adults over twenty-five could receive a certificate or training and that tuition is paid for. Is there any collaboration with that? Can some of those funds go towards this program? So Michigan Works in general coordinates with those state programs. The difference with this funding is since we used our CDBG funding and our coronavirus funding, we can serve people up to 80% of the area median income. That's a higher threshold than is usually potential uh, for those types of programs. So again, just like we did with Sarah, we can go up to 80% AMI, which scales toward Macomb incomes, and make sure that people who otherwise might be ineligible can still participate. So we certainly do coordinate with Michigan Works on all the state initiatives. This was vetted to make sure it was complementary and not duplicative of the existing program. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Commissioner Zinner. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Ernest. Hi. Um, I didn't see it when I was reading about this, um, but do they get paid to take this course? This course, the funds will be used to pay for the course. Yes. Um, they don't get payment directly to take it. Okay. Um, they may get some supports, uh, you know, computers or other things to help them out, but it's not directly paying them. And when they finish, what if they don't get take a job? What if they won't take a job or don't take a job? Uh, what's the expectation on that? Would there be repercussions or would they lose some of the um, money resources from the county? Sure. I mean, I'm not saying they would necessarily, yeah. but what is an expectation? I can follow up with you on any of the penalties uh, that may have been associated with this. I'm not sure we expect it to be a large problem, but it's a good question. Um, you know, part of this will be pre-vetted by Michigan Works and MCA staff for enrollment. We're looking for people that want to take advantage of an opportunity. Yeah. These opportunities listed, these certificates listed. If somebody wants to use this program and get a CDL, and then they don't want to take any job with a CDL, um, I'd say it'd be disheartening. Um, I'm not sure we anticipate it being a large problem, but I can't get back to you on any, any penalties. It probably won't be. Thank you for taking my question. That pays well, so it hopefully will. I hope so. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Van Sickle. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Ernest. Good afternoon. Do you have a list of people who are waiting to participate? In this current program? This current program hasn't yet been activated or advertised, but what we're looking to do is use our strong network uh, with Michigan Works. They see a lot of people. The other natural opportunity here is the SARA program itself, because this re program also requires COVID hardship. So this doesn't just require you to be low income. In fact, it goes up to 80% AMI, but it requires you to have some demonstrated COVID hardship, which we know all of those SARA applicants have. So the SARA applicants actually are a great opportunity for outreach. You know, if, if we help Commissioner Van Sickle because you couldn't pay your rent, we know you're already qualified to benefit from this type of program. And so we do plan on doing a lot of outreach 
to residents that have sought our services during the pandemic, as well as using Macomb Community College and Michigan Works as natural entities to help promote this. But we don't currently have a wait list. Uh, it's not currently active yet. And we've done things like this in the past, correct? Yes. What percentage of the monies that we designated in the past were actually used? In other words, did did you run out of money because so many people wanted to do it, or only half the money was used because you didn't get enough? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I can't say there's been quite the context like right now with the pandemic. Um, also, Michigan Works has increased a lot of their programs, um, and I think it all depends on the complementarity. If Michigan Works is already paying for a funding source to go to Macomb Community College, we might not draw from this pot of funding. But because this is designed to be complementary and non-duplicative, we believe there's a high chance we'll enroll all 250 residents and use all the funding. Um, but it's a great question, and I can get back to you. I'm just not certain that the past is a good predictor of the present here because of the circumstance of COVID and the new funds that Michigan Works has. It may not be, but I don't have another predictor in mind, do you? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to give you that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, seeing no other speakers, please vote. Thank you, Ernest. Motion Thank passes 12 to 0. Okay, next item is a budget amendment for the prosecuting attorney for the 2021 calendar grant fund for $97,726. Need a motion to recommend to the full board. Motion to move. Second, Zinner. Support Zinner. Made by Wallace, supported by Zinner. Steve. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good to see everyone again. So this item and the next item are, are related. As you recall, in the summer of this year, uh, Prosecutor Lucido came before you and indicated he received a grant for $97,000 from the state police. We've utilized that money to fund two special part-time prosecutors for the last half of the year. The dollars for that grant have been accounted for in the general fund. The purpose of this particular amendment is to simply transfer those dollars into a special revenue fund. The next adjustment is to add money to the 2022 budget because about three weeks ago we received notice that that grant has been extended for another year. So those dollars will also be accounted for in that same fund. So they're interrelated uh, in that nature. So if you have any other questions, uh, I'll be happy to try to field them. If they're more operational in nature, I, you know, I may have to follow up with uh, Prosecutor Lucido. Okay, I see uh, no speakers on this item. Please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes 12 to 0. And the next item is uh, also a budget amendment for prosecuting attorney for the 2022 calendar grant fund for $180,682. Need a motion to recommend a full board? So move, Hall. Moved by Hall, supported by Wallace. Steve, you want to add anything else to that? No, thanks. Okay. Seeing no speakers, please vote. I, I have requested to speak. This is moving real slow, so <coughs> so I don't know yep. what's going on. No problem, on. Commissioner. And it, it, obviously, the system is moving, so if anyone just flag me, we'll give you time on the floor it's a real quick question and see my blank screen I can't pull it up but under the description um, oh okay now it's up under the description it's I think it says two part-time but this is for the this is for full-time positions right no, two special two part-time special prosecutors oh okay all right <clears throat> I, I, uh, I thought I saw somewhere else in here that it was two full-time positions all right no, thank you two part-time Okay. Um, seeing no speakers, please vote. Motion passes 12 to 0. Uh, next item is budget amendment for the general fund indirect cost allocation adjustments. I uh, need a motion to recommend this to the full board. Made by Romano, supported by Zinner. Steve? Uh, so the uh, amendment before you is a routine amendment that we come to you uh, with every year. At this time of the year, for 
the purpose of adjusting the indirect cost charge uh, expense in the general fund departments to match the most recent cost allocation plan. So in the case of 2021, when the budget was established a year or so ago, we only had the 18 plan. Those are the dollars. We now have the 19 plan, so we do this every year, and we're adjusting the expense upward in all of these uh, departments with a corresponding increase in revenue. This whole thing is budget neutral to the general fund. It's, it's a cost accounting uh, measure. <clears throat> okay, I see. Yep. Oh, there you are, <laughs> Commissioner Matuzak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve, I just want to uh, clarify. So, the budget we just adopted, those indirect costs are based on 19 because 19. we only have 19. We'll be doing this again in right. 22. Right. No, I'm just trying to get the 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 time frame set. Correct. We should be getting the 2020 plan. We should have it actually. We may have Okay, have it. so our indirect costs are two years behind. Essentially, just based on timing of. Okay. Because the, the folks that do the plan have to have right. audited numbers yeah, yeah. and so no, on. I got so. it. I got it. I'm just trying to yep. figure out the timing here. It's a timing here. thing. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, I'm seeing no other speakers. Please vote. Motion passes 12 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next is correspondence, the 2021 equalization study for 2022 equalized values. Just need a motion to receive and file. So moved. Made by Song, supported by Farrington. Chairman. Yep, Commissioner Brown. Well, we have the director come in and give a report on uh, that report. Normally, normally we get a report. Thank you very much. She is here very for any I questions. Hoping, I was hoping to avoid that. <laughs> um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure yeah, to be significant. here. significant. Um, so this is me doing what you're supposed to do, or me doing it on your behalf. And uh, this is a culmination of the hard work of all of my employees. I just made it pretty for you guys. But um, they've been working on this for about nine months. They've been studying and analyzing sales. They've been doing appraisals. They've been doing all kinds of work behind the scenes. And this is the culmination and the summary of their, um, of their work. And so basically what we do... Um, we determine a true cash value for all the different property classifications in each local unit. We then take a look at where their assessments are. Uh, these are aggregate studies. It's not an individual property, but it's a, it's a total, um, it's an aggregate of each property class within each uh, local unit. And then what these ratios are is the distance from 50. So in Michigan, you have to assess properties at 50% of true cash value. That's what you're assessed at. It's not what you're taxed at. It's what you're assessed at. And um, this ratio then is an indication of how far away from 50 each local unit is. So the one that's always um, of interest is the residential values, being that residential pretty much drives the county values and um, all the different budgets uh, relative to property values. And so um, that amount for this year, even in a pandemic, is at 6%. So what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. We have a pretty healthy market right now. Uh, I, I, when I talked to you guys in April, I have no idea how to value properties in a pandemic. I've never been in a pandemic before. There's no real classes on how to value a property in a pandemic situation. So we're kind of flying along and just kind of noting what's happening and then putting it all together and, and bringing it to you. But uh, res, res market looks good, 6% increase, so that's great. What does that mean for you guys? Well, taxable value is what determines our taxes. We have a 3.3 uh, CPI this year, so that's great. You might think you're going to get more taxes, but it's probably going to result in a bigger rollback, which means you'll probably end up right about where you were before. So at this time, that's about as detailed as I can get about where we are. This is a roadmap for the local units 
a, a target to get to, however, however they do the studies and the different things on their end. But I would be happy to answer any additional questions you guys might have. Commissioner Kleinfeld. Is this not an action item because of what we did a, a couple months ago, or we don't have this is a receive and file? This as is just a receive and file. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Farrington. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for mm -hmm. coming. Oh, I got an echo. Um, when you say a 6% increase, is that a 6% increase in property values or a 6% increase in county property values because of new homes being built in addition to the increase? So, so everything that I do has nothing to do with um, permits and new construction or losses in value. This is strictly a market value increase. Second, thank you. Second mm -hmm. question. Um, I might have the answer based on that, but I know what you're doing is, is looking back. Mm -hmm. Is there any predictive value to the skills or in the anal analysis that you and your department does? Um, well, right now, the, the sales that have occurred in the last segment, which is normally what we would use, uh, let's say uh, when we went back to the crash time, we, we uh, reverted to a one-year study, and the one-year study was um, a period that started on October 1st and ended September 30th. So that was real predictive of what was happening or, or responsive of what was happening. We're still seeing in this last year, you know, if we were using a one-year sales study, we're still seeing about the same amount of sales and the same distance uh, from the assessments. Okay. And, you know, there's the, it's, for us, it's all about supply and demand. Right now, there is not a supply and there's a demand. So the values are up. Yeah, you know? and I know we have several yeah. uh, real estate professionals on the commission. Um, so I guess my final question is, and maybe this is along with Steve, but when you look at, when Steve looks at predicting tax revenues for the in upcoming couple of years, mm -hmm. are you two getting together on what you've seen? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I didn't yeah. know where the numbers came from, so it's your, yeah, that's what we, I need. Yeah, we Thank talked you. about that as soon as we kind of knew where the CPI was falling in. We were talking about next year at this year's budget yeah. session. So. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. you. Do you look at the ratios over time? Well, you, you can, I guess, if you can pull a report out look at ratios over time and see where they're coming in. They should be close to 50 though, right? That's the goal, right? To be close in to 50? In April, yes. In, in March and April, when I come to you, properties, so this is this is their starting numbers. I mean, I think I, 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 think I put that in the um, agenda item. This is the starting point. So when, when I deliver, um, you know, the later pages of this, document are the 4018 reports. They basically take that line for agricultural, commercial, or industrial, uh, residential, and they load it into their computer. That's where they start. Then they do their own land value studies. They do their own um, economic condition factor studies because we all, everybody in the state uses the same, uh, the same cost manual. We have to by law. Uh, then the state gives different uh, multipliers by county. And believe it or not, uh, we are number one with the highest multiplier, uh, with um, St. Clair County being right in there. We're higher than everybody else. So I guess that's just the way it is. Uh, we don't determine that. The state, the state does. So we're limited by the costs in the cost manual, the county multipliers, but then the local unit takes it to their local unit and their independent neighborhoods by studying the sales in defined neighborhoods. Neighborhood doesn't mean a subdivision neighborhood, but an area of their city or township. They study the sales, look at those assessments, and then determine you know, if they need to go up and down. So, so if, I say, you know, if I say a specific unit has to increase the residential values by 5%, that doesn't mean that every property increases by 5%. Some may go down if the sales in that area indicate they go down. Some may go up 12%. You know, but at the end of the day, where they start is here. When they bring their stuff to me in April and then I bring it to you, it has to have moved up to a point where it's somewhere between 49 and 50 the, okay. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. Um, okay. Like Sterling Heights came in right now at 49.9. It's a pretty good number right off the bat. For which one? For Sterling Heights. No, no, no. For, 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 for the, uh, 
That would be industrial class. Just look at industrial class for yeah, the industrial stuff is a little tricky. Uh, we have some sales that are that are difficult in there. Um, and what I'm talking about is some of the um, the marijuana uh, growing facilities. The state has not really given us any uh, guidance on how to value these. And so typically the the sales that you would see on these buildings are not what we're seeing now. You know, they're much higher now. And it kind of goes back to when we had all the problems with the big boxes and the Walgreens and the Rite Aid selling for way, way, way more than what they were really valued at. And, you know, trying to navigate that without guidance from the state, we're kind of, um, we're kind of lagging on that. Um, Macomb County did just put on the Macomb Assessors Organization. We had two um, assessors from Warren that uh, put on a class on how to value these, and they brought in some experts and it was given some con ed for assessors. So hopefully that will maybe start another conversation with Lansing to get this put together for us, because it it's very difficult. You know, if you have to class it as it's typically used, it's an entirely different value of that building because the sales are coming in way higher because they have an intended use. You know, so that's tricky. So, you know, I don't know what, I don't know, I don't have the pulse of what's happening in the industrial market in Sterling Heights, mm. but, you know, either their assessor is just right on, <laughs> you know, which a, doesn't happen it, very it often. It indicates it's pretty, it sounds like somebody's on the mark or yeah. something's going on. But on the other side of my district, Memphis, in the residential class, they're 38%. So Memphis is interesting because Memphis has, uh, for those of you who have never been in Memphis, it's a very small community um, and we never have enough sales. This year is the first time since I've been here in six years where we actually had enough sales data to analyze. And that's what it indicated. And we had a long talk with the assessor and you know, for years we've always used an appraisal study. And again, an appraisal study, you know, that's us trying to predict what the value of a property is using cost manuals and different multipliers versus somebody that's actually saying, hey, I'm gonna give you 200,000 for that house. You know, to us, a sale is a much better indicator of a value of a property than my staff checking some stuff off in a computer using, you know, uh, rates that have been determined by others. So when we talked to the assessor about that, he was kind of excited that he actually had enough sales to be indicative and, and so we went with it. And perhaps he needs some land value increases because again, it's not gonna be a new construction thing that's gonna increase these values. New construction has absolutely no bearing on getting these ratios to 50%, it's all market. And so, you know, maybe maybe his land values need to be increased or his ECFs are off or, and I'm sorry, I'm saying ECFs, like you know what that is, that's an economic condition factor. That's what brings the local unit into play on bringing the values up because they have the state, they have the state rates, the state county multiplier, and then the ECF is how they bring it in to their local. And the market. reason I, it's interesting looking at these is in the past we had communities that were we're taxing fairly compared to everyone else. We're playing by the same set of rules. They, for whatever reason, they drifted off the course, and they were effectively the tax rate was cheaper living in one city than another city. They weren't using the same process apparently. And, and I hope this is not within the last six years since. No, I this this is back here. in the nine, late nineties. Okay. okay. But okay. I remember that. Story. That's why I asked these questions about ratios, and yeah. I look at the ratios to see what's does anything out of spec. Yeah. So, but, yeah, no, they, these are, you know, um, you guys are very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. I have the best staff in the state. I will tell you that over and over and over. Uh, they are very, very good at what they do. They are very schooled at what they do, and they have a lot of knowledge and experience. So I trust their, I trust their decisions on, uh, on their appraisals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, Kristen, a couple questions. So when you, when you talk about new construction, you said it's not part of this. Right. But what you're saying, though, is that the, I'll say it could be part of it, but it has to be 100% assessed on the tax roll to be part of this study, correct? So, so this is this study is basically taking an assessment at a local unit, aggregates all added up. We just randomly select them, or sales that have incurred that makes them randomly selected because they sold, and then we come up with a true cash value either by using a sale or us developing. Um, 
a brand new house isn't typically a sample. Okay. These are based on samples, random, okay. random, you know. Got it. So that's how it, that doesn't come into And mind. then earlier you said about the rollback from 6% to 3%, we're right, right back. Can you, can you explain that? Sure. So back in the day when Headley was first introduced, we didn't have taxable value. We just had assessments, and apparently back then, assessors went rogue with their values, and they were increasing values to whatever they needed the budget to get to. So somebody came up with this brilliant rollback to, to limit the amount of... Um, increase in that stuff and 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 if they exceeded that you know it was only the normal amount of increase per year like a CPI increase per year and if it was over and above that they would roll it back so that you could only collect enough taxes uh, to to get to that increase by that CPI okay so now fast forward we have tran we have taxable value taxable value already kind of does it it limits us to the CPI increase every year okay so if there's no changes to the property values, your properties will increase by the CPI on the taxable value side. Your assessment goes all over the place. Whatever I say, kind of, my people, that's where it goes. But the taxable can only go up by the CPI or 5%, whichever is the lesser of the two. So aren't we already kind of limiting that? So when the state tax commission had to figure out how to interpret Headley with taxable value, um, they, they buy the book and they interpret it to not consider specific things in that, like um, the pop-ups, okay? And so those are still not included. That would be the adjustment increase when a property sells. It supposedly, that's like where it catches up to its assessment and then we start over. Well, that pop-up amount is not included in that. So when you look at um, the overall increase, it, it takes a look at just you know losses, CPI new, that's all that's in there. And then it says, hey, wait a minute, we're still coming up higher than what we should be. So then it effectively rolls it back. And we, so I have to calculate on your behalf. I calculate millage rollbacks in June, and then whatever our millage rate happened to be this, this year, I will then apply that millage rollback fraction to it and roll your millage back so that according to whatever your ending um, taxable value was, it will not generate enough taxes to exceed what that allowed increase is, if that makes sense. Everybody got that? <laughs> Uh, and, and that's actually not too bad for me because when I first started in this business, when somebody said Headley, I went, la, 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 la. Headley is very complicated. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's something that the school districts have been screaming about for years. Local units have been screaming about for years. You know, you've got that, that limitation. Now they've, you know, taken away the revenue sharing. And, you know, it's like, you know, some of the school districts are really suffering. You know, and so there's talk about trying to sway the legislature to maybe consider that pop up in the calculation, because then, you know, we're already we're already lessening the taxable values by uh, by the CPI. So my last question, yeah. more for Steve. So then, what did we end up with our final number for the budget? What was our percentage five? Okay. And I told him I think two. Did we say two? Don't didn't we say like two two? We usually keep it. I usually tell him because he'll ask me. And right. I'll say three to be safe. Yep. Right now it's three. I, last year it was two to be mm -hmm. safe. So we ended up at five. That's great. Five overall. Overall. That's great. New Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So it, it will be less. And then of course, um, I think this is the last year. Twenty-two is the last year for the rolling of the uh, industrial personal. So come twenty-three, industrial personal will have fallen off the roll. So kind of interesting. I have no idea what's left. We're down into that last year coming off. Um, this will be the last year that we have any value in industrial personal. And that's, that's why that little note wow. is in there. You know, it's, I have no idea how to predict what the values are going to be for that. You know, it's based on the forms that they fill out and they pay, they pay a different uh, fee instead of property taxes. So, okay. uh, Commissioner Van Sickle. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Hi. I had some questions about this number you said the state supplies for each county. Yes. And that Macomb County happens to be the right. highest or lowest? 
We are, so, so it's a multiplier. So you get your rate, but then because it's in Macomb County, apparently we're expensive here. Either our, our supplies are more expensive, our labor costs are more expensive, our management costs are more expensive than other places in the state. So before any of the local units do anything to figure out what a value of a property, they have to add this county multiplier. And it depends on the, the structure. If it's a residential brick, it's one thing. If it's residential siding, it's a different one. Commercials, commercial properties, industrial properties, ag properties, they all have different multipliers. But when I looked, when I looked at the values, it's always interesting, uh, the St. Clair County Equalization Director and I have noted uh, for many years in a row now that we are, sometimes it's them, sometimes it's me. So there's a, whole, there's a whole set of these numbers yes. all for all different categories. Yes. Okay. And um, is, there any, is there any reason for us to want to protest those numbers? And is there any, um. is, is there any path for that? <laughs> Um, my endeavors with the state uh, don't seem to go go very well. Um, this is something that is based on their studies of those items that I said, labor costs and management costs and all those other things that are available are a part of valuing a property. Um, we, St. Clair County, us, Oakland County and Wayne are of course the highest in the state. St. Clair County and us is higher than Oakland, but not by much, and, and Wayne County, but not by much. So if we're at 1.27 as the multiplier for a residential one, I believe, and, and sorry, I don't have a post-it note on it, but I'm going by memory. I think it's 1.27. Um, Oakland County would be 1.25. Meanwhile, other counties would be 1.14. You know, so that's a significant difference. In it. But again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's lumber costs. It's it's all the the agents of production in, in building a, you know, because these are this is a cost manual. So it's talking about the the components of building something that we're adjusting those costs by. And these numbers are changed yearly. Every year. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Just and I mean we may actually have to have um, and maybe Steve would be the one to do it because we have so many. Um, new commissioners who might not understand how proposal A and Headley work together. Um, I think we might have to have something to explain that in more depth, but, but as you talked about, it's a good thing to have that stability, but there's a fatal flaw in it in mm -hmm. that you can roll back, but you can't roll up. So you roll back to keep the taxes stable but in a catastrophic uh, housing market crash, as the houses sell and it resets, you can never get that back for no. years and years and years. No. So, and, and in strange situations when the market crashes, we were still increasing taxes, but property values were dropping because that was not included. For a in while, that. yes, yeah. because they were so undervalued. But mm -hmm. when they sell, then it gets set at that brand new level. Right. So one of the things that took place, a lot of people talk, uh, um, uh, and, it, and it may apply in other states in the federal government and things, but a lot of people talk about bloated government and all the money flowing. Um, what happened in 2008 sort of forced all the locals to get really slim and and not have a lot of employees and not pay employees a lot of money and not have all this excess and we're we're actually just now getting to the point of recovery but i don't know if everybody up here understands how those two work with each other and and how that's a system unique to michigan that means when there's a when there's a nation nationwide recession or depression we don't get to recover the way that everybody else does. So just putting it out there. Thank you. Again, yeah. Commissioner Zinner. Thank you, Chair. Kristen, I love listening to you. You're so passionate and completely knowledgeable. You sound so honest. It's very refreshing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Now that someone doesn't sound so honest, <laughs> I'll have a few words. No, 
the House is right now considering, there's legislation in Lansing right now to double small business personal property tax exemption to 180000 And there's, um, there's a concern it could cost local units almost $50 million in revenue aggregately. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, do you have any idea of how that may affect us directly as a county? All of our locals will feel, feel it too, but do you have any comments on that? So um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I do have some comments, some of them I can't say here. Um, on this particular topic, though, you know, one of the things that I, if you're going to give an exemption, just give the exemption. Don't make somebody have to file for it. You know, fill out the form. The computer automatically determines, oh, you're at 80, you're exempt. Okay, that's not how it works. You have to fill out a form. Okay, so with this, now you have more people who haven't been getting it. Now, all of a sudden, they're going to qualify for it. Now, it's going to be a whole new training process to get them to go. Um, this is an exemption that, kind of like the, the industrial one, I can't really speak on it because you don't get it unless you file for it. I can't imagine most of the assessors are going to be out there saying, hey, file this form. So, you know, I mean, when I was the assessor of independence, because that's where I was before I came here, we did send out a letter and say, hey, you qualify for this, you would have qualified for it last year, why are you not filing this form? Um, not everybody does that because you aren't required to do that. So this could be this could be a big deal, you know. And I don't know the individual. I deal with aggregate numbers. I deal with totals, summaries of the whole classification. Um, I have some parcel counts. I could probably have a report run. I don't have it today, but I could probably figure out how to run a report and get that to you. But it wouldn't be exact because that entity or that uh, company would have to file for it and you know there's there's actually a couple of the industrial ones that refuse to file for it it's too much paperwork they don't want to deal with it they'd rather just pay the t property tax and be done so it's you know it's one of those those situations um, but I it was my understanding that it could possibly have been voted today was the last session for the year it's possible they're voting on it right, right now. now. Right, yeah, that's but. it. So maybe we'll know. And then, and then if we do, in fact, get to that point, I can, I can figure it out if I survey or if I have. Um, we have a pretty good uh, database guy in IT. Um, I could probably ask him to run that well, for us, and he could. We'll get just it. hold off and see if it actually happens. But you know, yeah, it, it's, it, it it's something that's been out there and kind of relevant to what we're talking about today about. Oh yeah, uh, property values and get to Commissioner Kleinfeld's concerns about local units of government being squeezed. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, seeing no other speakers, thank you, Kristen, mm -hmm. for being here and answering all our questions. Okay. Please vote. Yes. So the pain. just briefly, it's not, I'm more willing to put something together, just briefly to comment on Commissioner Kleinfeld's uh, comment about you can roll back, but you never get to roll forward. So if you remember, uh, you may or may not, Commissioner Brownwell, in 2009, the commissioners raised the maximum millage from 4.2 to 4.5685. I'm sure they didn't raise the maximum, they went to the maximum. We are around 4.4 now because of continued rollbacks. So that I don't know the the amount of money that we're not getting because of that, but I can put that together. It's, it's a significant amount, though. So that whole idea of rolling back, but you can't roll forward. Just thought I'd throw that in. That'd be great to see, Steve. Thank you for that. Motion passed 12 to 0. Uh, next item is public participation. This is the second opportunity for public participation for a max of three minutes on any issue. Anyone from the public like to speak? Going once, twice, we'll close public participation. Next item is commissioner comments. Commissioners like to speak. Uh, commissioner Kleinfeld. So Navy beat Army. It'll be a long year for my family because we'll stew on it for an entire year. Um, Army has stolen the Navy goat um, 
several times over the years, Navy has only successfully stolen the Army mule once. The academies forbid it because when the Navy midshipmen tried to steal the Army mule, they cut some electric lines and zip tied some cadets up, and so it's expressly forbidden. The last time that uh, Army was successful, the uh, cadets were written up for misappropriating the Navy mule. Um, but this year, they successfully stole a goat. It's just they, they stole the wrong goat. They didn't steal the right goat. I guess uh, Navy had a decoy. So um, if you guys don't watch that game, it's a fun game to watch. I think it, it, everybody talks about the, you know, the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry, but there's nothing like Army-Navy. It's a pretty big deal. It's, I'm depressed, but uh, the three, Army, Navy, Navy, and Air Force will share the Commander in Chief's trophy. Useless to you guys, but I wanted to announce it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Zinner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one of my brother-in-laws was uh, invited to go to that game. So I was furiously trying to find it on the TV, and I couldn't find it. So I don't know how you found it, but people found it, but I didn't get to see it. I know it was advertised, but um, I have two proclamations that I'll be giving, one today to um, attribute to tribute to recognizing the St. Clair Shores champion force athletes as the 2021 first and second place national cheerleading champions. They can, this is eight to 12, eight to 14 year olds <coughs> competing with 10 other um, teams and they had to go through regional and state competitions to get this. And um, they're, they did quite a, that's quite an accomplishment I think for that age group. And um, so I'll be seeing them today. And also, um, Redeemer Lutheran Church in St. Clair Shores, uh, you might have seen this in the paper, has a 100th year anniversary had it in the fall. And um, I finally was able to connect with them with um, other activities. And um, I will be seeing them January 2nd at the church and giving them their plaque and it uh, started with two people a hundred years ago. If you could imagine the activity then, imagine the roads then, imagine everything. And uh, they went to plant a church and found a pastor and they connected with Redeemer Church in Mount Clements. And my dad had told me about the roads back in those days. His uncle would come from Roseville to go to a doctor in Mount Clements and would spend the night because of the time period. So everything was different back then, and um, they, uh, they, they're thankful for their pastors over the years because they, they promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, and their hope is that they will still be of service um, as they are now and better and continuing for another 100 years. Lovely people that I've spoken with. And thank you very much, Chair. Commissioner Matuzak. Uh, just to let folks know that um, after 10 years of service on the State Board of Canvassers, I today resigned, effective tomorrow. Um, I've done my part for 10 years, saving democracy, somebody else's turn. <laughs> <laughs> so just wanted to let people know that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, seeing no other speakers. Made by Romano, <laughs> supported by Haw. Please vote. Thank you, Commissioners. Motion passes 12 to 0.